what that young kid would feel like yeah. and teleport myself back then to remind myself of just how lucky we are. Um, you know, CS is all digital now, it's different, but it's always exciting, so that, that's why I love it. Now, you know, <laughs> for you though, you know, you're a streamer, you're an esports owner. I'm gonna throw it out here. You called me Mr. CS, I'm gonna call you gaming icon. Me? You? Who, me? Who, you? So, oh, what, what excites <laughs> what excites you about CES? Um, for me, it's the people. I think it's just hanging out with some friends, of course, visiting them every year and uh, getting to catch up. But I also love that you're just at the forefront of all this new tech. Sometimes you get perks like being able to try it, like be close, up close and personal to a concept car or go in an actual like personal travel drone. You know, I'm all about those. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just any of that new tech. Like one time I got uh, driven around CS just around Las Vegas in a brand new Mercedes that I would never in a million years get a chance to drive in and, and like hang out in. But uh, I got to do it. I think the experience. That's what, it, that's what right. CS is all about. It's the experience. And, yeah. and and making new friends every year. Every year, <laughs> we're officially best buds. We are. We are. From I here mean, on out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but as we mentioned at the top of the show, we're fresh off a C Space session. Remember, if you'd like to see more panels like that one, head over to the C Space tab under the program menu. You can also search for C Space sessions in the uh, scheduler and add them to your show. Make sure to do that. That's right, Naomi. Now, the C space is a great place to see. Nicely done. Thank you. How content, marketing, and entertainment converge. We've got sessions from companies like Condé Nast, as well as the Nielsen Company. Really a stellar place to see innovations, talking about the latest trends of the day and how they can shape the future of so many sectors of the world. And speaking of entertainment, I wanted to make a quick correction here. The iHeart session with Ryan Seacrest and Dua Lipa, because I like to say it like that, they will be later today, not tomorrow. And then let's just like one up this thing because this is CES 2021. It's going to be followed by a live performance by the one and only Billie Eilish right here. I know. Right I'm here. a huge fan of her. I can't wait to see that. Uh, now from entertainment to health, I'd like to welcome a guy who is helping shape the future of remote care with innovations in digital health and one impressive goal to strive for. Please welcome Amron Healthcare's CEO and President Randy Kellogg. Welcome, Randy. Ooh, what up, Randy? Thank you, Naomi and Brian. Thanks for having me on. Oh, we yeah. love having you here. This is great. Yeah, of course. Uh, with Amran's mission of going zero uh, heart attacks and strokes, um, what are the strides that your company has made toward this goal uh, here at CES? So every year at CES, we're trying to introduce new products, or this year, a new service that helps people take better care of their heart, uh, manage their heart health, and leads to more people achieving the goal of no heart attacks and no strokes. Unfortunately, in these times, it's kind of tough because people aren't going to the doctor as much as they need to. Uh, they aren't uh, taking as good care of themselves, so we're really working hard this year as in every year to help people know more about what they can do to take care of themselves. So Randy, you know, I remember maybe it was a couple years ago, you had that really amazing ping pong robot demo, but it actually brought a lot of attention to how you guys function as a health you know, company as well. So I'd love to know kind of what are some of these key announcements that Omron is making right here at CES 2021? So the, there's really two announcements we're making this year. Uh, one's a continuing announcement. You guys even mentioned it. It's about our mission, going for zero, zero heart attacks and strokes. We're still on it, we're still continuing. Uh, it's an ongoing mission. It's a big, bold mission and there's a lot of work to do. And we're, we're keeping on that, that goal. As a part of that, and the second thing we're announcing, or the really big thing we're announcing at CES, is the launch of our first service. So we're a product company. You saw our ping pong robot table. I've got our uh, wristwatch <laughs> blood pressure monitor here, but we're now taking the step to providing a service to the industry, would be medical industry, so that physicians and, and patients can talk to each other better. Uh, and communicate better about their hypertension through our remote part, our remote uh, patient monitoring program called VitalSight. Now, telemedicine and remote patient monitoring have grown in popularity and availability during the pandemic. Uh, what is what do you think is the future of remote patient monitoring post pandemic? Well, the good news is remote patient monitoring was a big thing before the pandemic. Uh, telehealth, uh, telemedicine really grew dramatically during the pandemic, uh, which also leads to more remote patient monitoring. But remote patient monitoring was around for quite a while, uh, and insurance companies have paid for patients who have chronic conditions like hypertension to be able to monitor their health, share that data with their clinician uh, safely and securely, 
And then the physician can interact with that data and determine what dose of medicine you need to have. Uh, do you need more exercise? Do you have other conditions they need to take pay attention to? So really post pandemic, uh, we just see a continued expansion of remote patient monitoring uh, and the telemedicine business in general will help grow the remote patient monitoring side of it as well. Um, Randy, you know, I was also curious, we're talking about, you know, remote patient monitoring. We've seen how things have changed. Are there any maybe new things or that are leading us to what the future of this might look like post pandemic? Well, I think the big thing that uh, could happen and will happen actually as we move forward, whether it's pandemic or not, is uh, if doctors have more data about your condition, they can make better decisions about how to treat you. So what a remote patient monitoring program like VitalSight does is we provide the patient with a blood pressure monitor, a scale, and a hub. They open up the box, it's all ready to go. They put on the blood pressure monitor, start taking readings, step on the scales, start taking readings. And those readings show up in the doctor's electronic medical record. You hear it called EMR. Uh, that's when you see your doctor and they're down and they're typing away. They're in the EMR interacting with your information. So what now remote patient monitoring does is it provides additional information and it actually provides alerts so that if you're in a hypertensive situation and that reading comes through to their EMR, they actually get an alert that says, hey, Brian's got a problem. Let's take a look at it. They look at that alert. They can react to it. They can call you. Uh, they can ask you to come into their office. Whatever the response that needs to be done can be done. And there's more and more of that that can happen with the advent of more data and easily uh, attainable data or easily see visible data in the EMR. All right. And so what is the, what role do physicians play, uh, you think, in the future of remote patient care uh, from this point on? I think physicians are vital to the any kind of remote patient care because it's not just about uh, a computer or AI or anything like that looking at it. A physician needs to get their eyes on it or their staff needs to get their eyes on it. And when there's a, a situation that requires intervention, they need to be able to intervene and intervene quickly. So for us, and I think for the entire industry, it's the physician that will drive remote patient monitoring because you don't sit around and say, well, I have hypertension, maybe I should be in a remote patient monitoring program. No, you wait for your physician yeah. and they say, hey, uh, Naomi, I think you might have hypertension. I wanna put you in this program. Here's what it is, here's how it works. Here's why I use it because I trust the data I get. I use the data I get and it helps me take better care of you. You know, Randy, we asked you a lot of different questions, but this one's for you. You know, do you have any final thoughts? This is your time to tell us what's really on your mind. You know, any final thoughts about the future of everything that's happening? Well, I, I hope the future for everybody, whether it's uh, here at CES or anywhere, is better health, um, better safety, um, getting back together and, uh, and meeting like we always do in Las Vegas every year. Uh, but certainly, I think uh, people taking a, a bigger part, a bigger role in their own health care, uh, it, it's been accelerated by the pandemic. We need to keep on it. So if you're someone who now monitors their weight every day or monitors their blood pressure or monitors their glucose or monitors your EKG, whatever uh, uh, vital sign you're looking at, uh, you need to keep doing that. And now we need to feed that data into your physician so that he or she can take action and help you live a longer, healthier life. We want to save lives. For us, we want to eliminate heart attack and stroke. The only way we can do it get, is by getting you, uh, one of the 27 million people who has stage two hypertension, to take better care of your health. So that's really what we're trying to do. Awesome. That's great. Thanks so much, Randy. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, thank you, Randy, thank so you. much for that insight. Uh, remember, you can follow Randy uh, through the event by searching for him specifically in the speaker directory and adding him to your show. So you can do that right now. All right, everybody. Well, speaking of things to add, if you're looking for more from the digital health community, we might just have a couple of recommendations, starting with another healthcare provider innovating in this space. Anthem has integrated their digital health platform, enabling members to better connect their claims with individual clinics and then organizing their healthcare experience like never before. So head on over to the Exhibitor Showcase to learn more about them. Hey, Brian, can we talk a little bit about Las Vegas for a minute? Uh, this hey, all, Naomi, yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> uh, this all digital show, you know, is obviously super cool. You know, the fact that we can do this in this day and age. Uh, but who's not missing Vegas right now, you think? 
Well, I think a lot of people are. You know, people were not so hot on Vegas over the years because they were a little jaded. And I think if you look across the internet and what people are saying on Twitter, even written articles, yeah. people are kind of realizing, oh, I miss CES. Yeah. You look at something like this that looks amazing. We have the sign here. And look, they're missing us big time too. I know that Vegas, you know, the strip maybe doesn't look nearly as dense as it would normally on CES. I mean, we get bumper to bumper traffic. But this is a special time and a special place for the tech world. You know, I've said it before, this is the Super Bowl yeah. for it. This is our event. And so you and I are lucky to be here to experience it, to Definitely. feel it, uh, like that we're a part of it. Yeah. But people at home that are watching at home in their pajamas, um, <laughs> they might feel like they're missing it, but they're also really comfortable too. I think they are too. <laughs> I'd be hanging out in my PJs if it weren't for being here today. I, I would be too. <laughs> uh, and we know that Las Vegas is uh, such an amazing convention and an entertainment de destination. It has been hit especially hard uh, by the pandemic. Uh, to support the uh, Vegas community, the Consumer Technology Association owner and producer of CS has actually made a generous donation to Three Square, Southern Nevada's food bank and hunger relief organization. I think that's absolutely great. And that is so great um, and really so needed. If you like to make your own contribution, check this out. Go to 3square.org. We're excited to get back to business in person. And guess what? I can't wait to see you all back in Las Vegas. I mean, we've actually never met on the show floor. This, this is the first time. We've yeah. all been there for years. So how many years do you think you've roughly gone maybe about? I, probably my first one was 2013. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I was 2008. I think this is technically year 13 for me. Oh my gosh. I know. More That's... than a decade. <laughs> yeah. I'm an oldie but a goodie. Yeah. All right. Let's see what the rest of CES 2021 has in store. We've got big keynotes coming up, including from Best Buy. I think I've heard from them a couple times. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> we'll hear from their CEO, Corey Berry, um, as she talks about jumping to the helm of that iconic retailer in 2020 of all years. Excited to hear her perspective for sure. Uh, then we've got the future reimagined keynote. This conversation brings together CEOs from Accenture and MasterCard as they sit down with LinkedIn News Editor-in-Chief Daniel Roth to talk tech. These companies have their pulse on so many aspects of our lives. Uh, should be a really great and interesting conversation about trends to expect and what gets them excited for the future. We'll round out our day with the even pop, the ever popular Last Gadget standing competition. Last Gadget standing, standing, standing. standing. <laughs> got to uh, do it. Yeah, we got to do it. Uh, where we name the biggest new tech of 2021. Uh, that, of course, uh, will be followed by the iHeartRadio presentation featuring a conversation with Ryan Seacrest and Duke. Dua Lipa and a performance by the one and only Billie Eilish. This is awesome because you have to remember Billie Eilish's concert, it's only gonna be available live here. This is how we keep you around watching for the entire day. You won't be able to see it on demand, only live here, so don't miss that. And then that is just today's fun. Tomorrow we're gonna kick things off with the Microsoft keynote featuring Brad Smith as he talks about the future of this tech giant. Then we just like dive into the world of entertainment with the talk about <laughs> consumer cravings and how the industry is stepping up to fill them. That kicks off with a keynote from Ann Sarnoff from Warner Media Studios and Networks Group, then followed by a panel that includes some of the minds behind General Motors and Nike, just to name a few. So all of this is definitely a must see. Rounding out the day in the event, it's the Walmart keynote, a fireside chat with CEO Doug McMillan. He'll speak about their experience during the pandemic and how this massive retailer is looking to the future. Okay, so we got a bunch of toys, kind of some fun stuff here that we like to show off. So yes. Naomi, this is our social board. Mm -hmm. If you look at our studio, you'll see like people are putting in tweets. We do want to remind you all at home, hashtag CES 2021. We'd love to know where you're from. You know, I like to go like, Tell me where you're from. Put it on, show your pride, <laughs> take a picture of yourself with your setup. We'd love to see it. We'll show this on throughout our broadcast, but let's kind of dig and dive in here yeah. and see what people are talking about. Um, I liked this guy over here. Let's see here. Is it me in control or oh, you? Oh, it's your, it's your, you're in control. <laughs> I'm right, in control. Try, try yours. All right, well, uh, it looks like here, I'm just trying to reset it actually because for some reason, I'm not able to scroll. Touch screen is not working. Well, in any case, uh, what I do want to say is uh, there's a lot of people sharing their pups who are watching alongside <laughs> them. Um, and yeah, it looks like AMD's presentation was obviously a big talking point. Jim uh, McGregor si says here, gives a preview of the upcoming third gen Epic processors, codenamed Mil uh, Milan. The new processor will be launching later this quarter. Of course, we all recently saw that as organizations. Uh, here's another one. The female quotient actually, which we'll be having on their show very soon also tweeted. Um, all right, in just a few minutes until Best Buy, uh, 
you know, are you excited to see what Best Buy has to say? I'm excited to see what Best Buy has. Look, we'll get back to the, we'll get back to our social yeah, board. You know, I we'll, think we needed a reset. We'll get it rolling and scrolling. Don't <laughs> even worry about that. But you know, Best Buy really saved my butt during the break. Um, PS5 was really hard to get. I loaded up on a lot of the accessories. They did this really cool kind of um, drive up where you could just pick them up. And you know, you, when you get those accessories earlier, before you even get the console. It just gets you more giddy and everything. But it was a really cool operation of how they kind of flipped the switch so and quickly. just changed on a dime yeah. you know, to accommodate us during this uh, pandemic. That's right. They did everything on the fly almost overnight, changing everything. So I'm excited to hear from Corey as well because uh, her perspective is really interesting. And, of course, t tackling some of the bigger issues that we experienced in 2020, you know, uh, diversity and inclusion is such a big conversation this year. So I'm excited to see uh, their approach and how they're taking the company forward into the future. Next up, this is our chance to hear from Best Buy CEO. Okay, well, next up, we're going to hear about Best Buy Corey CEO. But, you know, as we talk about Best Buy more, um, what was your experience with them? Uh, so I talked about the TV I purchased. <laughs> um, curbside pickup was really great. I thought that they integrated that great. So I got an 85-inch uh, Sony TV uh, just this year, and it was during the pandemic. We were due for an upgrade, and plus everyone's watching stuff from home. And I think the big thing this year was tech because we're trying to bring everything that we're us usually going outside to get, you know, theater experiences, um, you know, at-home dining, like cookware, all that sort of thing. Um, so it's going to be... Uh, um, for me, it was a really good experience to go there, make sure it was a, a safe rollout of mm -hmm. me taking the TV home. And then um, we actually bought a 95-inch TV. Yeah, you told me about we that. We took so it back. <laughs> it was way too big. <laughs> I, I don't know anyone that has actually purchased a 95, and that's got that have been massive. Yeah. I mean, it, it for the space that I had, I'd, I'd understand if you have a bigger space at home and you need to <laughs> fill it, but that thing had a presence in my living room, and I'm I was like, I'm wall. taking this back. It's, it's bigger than my couch, um, and then I switched it up for an 85-inch. But yeah, I think Best Buy uh, really will, it'll be an interesting conversation. I, I watched a little preview of it, so I'm excited for you guys to see it as well. Yeah. yeah. The other thing that is going on with just like retailers in general have had to really evolve. Uh, I think we've seen, look, brick and mortar places, period. We've seen this with uh, workout gym fitness centers. Oh, yeah. Right? Their, their business model has been totally changed. You, you now start seeing some of them taking some of that stuff outside, right, where people can still walk up and right. do some level of training. But in most places, you can't actually go into the gym to work out. I don't personally feel comfortable doing that yet. That's right. But retail in many levels have had to really, this has kind of accelerated how they've jumped over to digital. We've, we've known that digital transitions were coming. Even people getting familiar, like my mom, shopping for groceries yeah. and doing it online for the very first time. Yeah. That, that changes kind of how your brain approaches how we're going to be moving forward. You know, there's still a role, obviously, for these physical locations to exist and still be successful. But now you're going to start seeing this for a while where... Yeah. Like, you know, Amazon Prime was one of those things where, what is it, uh, the same day delivery, mm -hmm. where I would just buy it on the spot. And when I first did it, I'm like, okay, yeah, you pay a little extra. Yeah. But it's really convenient. Yeah, I think more people are using tech than ever before. And the, the question will be, how many people are going to be staying in that same mindset of doing everything online now that they've learned how to use it? Especially, you know, just my grandmother, for example, uh, finally picked up her first laptop so I could speak to her. Um, and yeah, I think for, for going forward, we're going to see a huge adoption of tech by a vast number of people, and uh, it'll just it'll just change the future. It's the question of whether or not we'll go back to how things used to be, or if it'll just be like a hybrid version. So, um, you know, <laughs> we've been talking about Best Buy. I I have now been playing with my screen a little bit, and I think the powers that be oh, have allowed me to control our social feed. Finally, so I think I think if the team wants, to, we'll go visit that again just to let yeah. you all know. Please, you know, CES 2021 is the hashtag to use. That's right, and we will showcase your tweets, you want to throw up some fun little memes and gifs, that's good with me too. Yeah, we can actually watch the videos or the gifs. I saw Baby Yoda earlier. Um, all right, what's next up, Brian? Well, next up, it's our <laughs> chance to hear from Best Buy CEO, Corey Berry. She is sitting down with Fortune Media's Alan Murray to give her vision of the future of tech. So look, put on your seatbelts, do it yes. with me, buckle up. Our next keynote is moments away. We'll see you later. I'm thrilled to introduce our next CES keynote presenter, Best Buy CEO, Corey Barry. 
Corey took over as CEO in 2019 after 20 years at the company. Her commitment to the organization runs deep. She knows what it means to build and grow a great team. I am continually impressed by Best Buy's ingenuity. Recently, I wrote a book about how to succeed in our 21st century innovation economy. I talked about how technology is rapidly transforming the world around us and how we must embrace change and think like ninjas to succeed. Time and again, I look to Best Buy as a shining example of what it means to be a ninja innovator. From folding in Geek Squad into its core business in 2002, to acquiring health company Great Call in 2018 to offer senior-friendly tech products, Best Buy is synonymous with innovation. For more than 50 years, it has been the place for consumers to experience the latest from the CES show floor on retail shelves. And Corey is committed to delivering on Best Buy's promise to enrich our lives through technology. Corey will be joined by Alan Murray, president and CEO of Fortune, who shifted from the Wall Street Journal editorial board to head and grow the Fortune media empire. They'll talk about Corey's vision for the future of tech, leading through a pandemic, and why diversity and inclusion are critical in today's innovation economy. Please join me in welcoming Corey Barry and Alan Murray to CES. So Corey, it, it, it's such an honor to be with you today, and, and it's been an honor to get to know you over the past year. But I have to say, you picked one hell of a time to become a CEO. You never know what you're walking into in these <laughs> jobs, Ellen. And likewise, it's been a pleasure to get to know you, and thank you for taking the time today. But. Uh, I think every every new CEO would say the first year was unexpected. I will tell you, the first year was incredibly <laughs> unexpected. You have a story to top all of theirs, I'm sure. So, look, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you here about the products and how consumption habits change because it's a great window on technology usage. I also want to talk to you about the business and how your delivery of those products changed. And I want to talk to you about leadership. Uh, uh, but but let's start with the products. What did you see after the pandemic hit? Yeah, there were um, really three things that we saw almost immediately. So the first was our hypothesis around enriching lives through technology became instantly the reality for every single person, meaning all of a sudden we were all stuck at home on the backs of technology. For anyone with kids, your kids literally overnight were learning from home. For anyone with large corporate offices, all of your employees were likely working from home. We were entertaining from home. We were cooking. Everything overnight became uh, available on the back of technology, even connecting, just having conversations like this. And so that that was the immediate need that we saw. Hence the reason we felt it was so important to continue to provide those products to our customers. Now, the second thing we saw, though, is the way in which we were going to provide those products to our customers was instantly different. People took immediately to more digital means. They were researching digitally, and they were immediately using all the digital tools at their disposal. And we went to curbside uh, within the first three weeks of March, but we also saw the customer going immediately to those digital means. And the third thing that we saw literally overnight is that our employees needed to work differently. So whereas we went into the pandemic with very structured jobs and responsibilities, you cover home theater, you cover computing in the store, again, overnight, because we switched to a curbside model, everybody was pitching in to just get the gear to the customer the way that that they wanted. So that meant we had an, an incredibly more flexible workforce, but we did it without really thinking about it. We did it overnight. <laughs> and each of those things has remained true since literally those early hours that we switched our operating model. They've in fact just grown in terms of their importance. I, I wanna talk about each of those in a little more detail, but let's start with just needing the gear to operate from home. We all know the stories about toilet paper shortages. Did you have shortages? Were there products that you simply didn't have the inventory to meet the demand? Yeah, we definitely talked about that. So in, in our first quarter, we like I said, we moved to curbside and we scaled back on some of our inventory responsibly um, because all of us weren't sure exactly what the world would look like on the other side. As we headed into June, we opened our stores back up to traffic and immediately we saw that business ramp and ramp at levels we had never seen before. And of course, when you have that demand supply imbalance, you just can't keep up with it. And I think most of the people watching 
would realize you, you literally couldn't even manufacture fast enough to keep up with it. And so unfortunately, in some of the key areas around, especially that working, learning from home, but also importantly, some of that cooking and, and entertaining from home, um, you just could not keep the gear. I mean, nobody knew there'd be a run on webcams. Um, that was quite at the pace <laughs> that we saw. And yet suddenly it became the the hottest item that we had. And so it, it definitely was a challenge to make sure we had all the gear people wanted. Any other big surprises other than webcams, things that, you know, suddenly everybody wanted uh, that you weren't uh, expecting? I think it wasn't so much the things, it was, especially as the pandemic has worn on, it was creating the more fulsome solutions. So it started yeah. with computers and everybody wanted the computer. And then Alan, you know, as we were all stuck home staring at the dot in our computer, we realized, oh no, I do need a webcam. So I maybe perhaps look just a little bit clearer on the other side. And then I wanted speakers or a microphone so that I was clear both in what I was hearing and what I was saying. And then I wanted a nice ring light so that at least I looked maybe like I was, you know, stepping out of my office occasionally. And it was more this idea that as you had more time to think about what the best experience might be at home, then you started bolting on um, the, the ancillary products. And I think that part was really interesting. I think the other thing that was interesting is how much people needed to entertain at home and what a demand there was on, um, whether it was home theater so that you could stream everything you wanted or gaming, which, you know, everyone had kind of been waiting for new gaming console launches. And yet, even in that interim, while people were waiting, they were looking for anything they could do with their, in my case, 14 year old boy uh, to help them entertain themselves at home and not drive you crazy. So, you know, one of the things that people have said about 2020 is that everything accelerated, <laughs> sort of every trend that was in place suddenly became twice as fast or three times as Trends was the move away from uh, in-store commerce to online commerce, um, uh, uh, but but hybrid became really important. I mean, can you talk about that? How did you compete with purely online uh, uh, channels that were selling the same products? One of the most interesting things that we saw, even as our online sales ramped, and you know, as of Q3, they were up 175 percent ish. 40% of those sales were still being picked up either in our stores or curbside. So there was this real demand to be able to come to the store to get this item when I wanted it, where I wanted it, as fast as I wanted it. And so for us, what became um, really interesting, we, we had a hypothesis, we had an investor day just over um, a year ago. And one of the things we said is we assumed this digital penetration was going to increase. And therefore we needed to double down on our fulfillment mechanisms. And importantly, we needed to put the customer in control. And to your point, what we thought might take three to five years to penetrate this highly happened overnight. And so one of the greatest things was all of the supply chain investments we've been putting in for literally four years, we flexed all of those up to meet that large scale demand. But what we also did is we put the customer in control and whether the customer wanted it on their couch, whether they wanted it curbside, whether they wanted it at the counter, that needs to not matter to us. We need to agnostically meet that customer wherever they are. And I think that's going to be the future for sure of retailing. Was it hard to get the stores on board for that? You know, what was amazing is um, there's something very unifying about a pandemic. And what I mean is when you're so worried about your employees' safety, your customer safety, and making sure people get what you know they fundamentally need to live, that's a very unifying factor. Yeah. Yeah. And all of a sudden you worry a lot less about which channel is it happening in, which store is it happening in. And some of the real magic is watching the unification of our efforts against very common and honestly very basic problems. Yeah, so many great stories about that over the year. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the, the pandemic caused risk aversion to evaporate because risk then became out there. It was We knew what risk was, it was the coronavirus and everything else was unified uh, in trying to figure out the solutions. Uh, I can't tell you the number of CEOs I've talked to over the course of the last year who have said a version of what you said, which is we did things in we did things overnight or in weeks that we thought would have taken us months or years. A amazingly innovative period, even as it was an amazingly tough period. You're absolutely right. And the, it wasn't just that it was innovative. It's that companies also learned how to iterate. 
And especially as a large footprint retailer, I mean, there are many companies that are represented at CES who are very used to iterating and using more agile models. But as a large scale retailer with almost a thousand physical touch points, we don't iterate incredibly well. And yet to your point overnight, not only did we launch new ways of working, we had an incredible feedback loop with our stores or an incredible feedback loop with our customers. And as we heard how they wanted to interact with us, then we would change and move again. And that part, I give our teams more credit for than anything. This idea that it wasn't just you launched something, you actually kept working at it until you felt yeah. like the solution was yeah. the right. Having learned what you learned in your incredible first year as CEO, and knowing that much of that is, is gonna stay learned, we're yeah. not going to revert to 2019. What, what, when you look towards the future, what is the role of the physical store in serving people's technology needs? I think it's going to be more broad than it's ever been. Meaning the store is going to have, as we just talked about, a massive role in fulfillment. And you're going to need to enable the store to quickly and easily get that customer whatever they need in whatever time frame they want it. Do they want it same day? Do they want it within an hour? Do they want to come in the store? Do they want to get it curbside? Are they okay waiting for us to ship it? So this, this idea of stores as fulfillment epicenters is really important. But they also have a real experiential need to fill in our case. We definitely noticed as soon as we opened our stores back up, the places where our customers gravitated were those more complex sales. They wanted to have that interaction. So when they came to the store, they had high expectations for what that interaction and consultation would look like. And then finally, in our case, the store plays a very important role in support and help. And when I need that support, when I need someone to make sure this thing keeps working and is up and running for the long term, our stores play a really vital role in that. And that is a very hands-on experience. Help me understand what's not working for you and we'll help make it better. And so I think it's going to have to be equal parts yeah. here. We, we talk about all these, uh, this in, uh, incredible year we've just lived through is an accelerant of so many trends, including particularly the digital trends. But how do you predict what happens now? Are we gonna slow down again? Does uh, the acceleration continue? Uh, uh, have we picked up the pace of, of technology adoption? Uh, how are you foreseeing the future? Yeah, I think there isn't a world where people revert back to their, as you said, 2019 behaviors. And part of that is just a comfort level. Um, like I always joke, I knew the world had changed when my dad started getting his groceries ordered online and picked up curbside, right? He was never going to adopt that readily, or at least it was going to take a lot longer, but he was forced to. And now that he's comfortable with that curbside experience, he's more comfortable with curbside experiences in general. Telehealth has been another great example. We've gone through years of trying to push um, the consumer to adopt telehealth methodologies. And again, overnight, because it was required, you have a much deeper penetration of people who understand how to use telehealth tools. And I think it's this comfort level more than anything else that will continue to push the envelope. Now, what's interesting is once you have a great experience with one retailer or or even one provider of any kind, you expect that experience from everyone else that you deal with. So if I have a great curbside experience at Best Buy, I'm gonna expect everyone else can deliver that kind of curbside experience. And so I think customer expectations will also be raised in terms of what they can get done digitally, but importantly, in whatever way they want. We're already seeing that across the board, aren't we? A, a, a gap between the people who do it well and the people who don't do it quite so well. I mean, you must feel that in your business pretty clearly. Yeah, and I think it's also a bit of a gap in what the investment profiles looked like over the last you know, five, 10 years, because if you hadn't been investing heavily into those digital experiences, but also into that fulfillment infrastructure, it's very hard to make the Good. kind of movement that you need fast enough. I want to talk to you about leadership because Best Buy has always had a very well-deserved reputation for purpose-driven leadership. But that has to really come under the test when you have a year as challenging as 2020 was. So can you talk about how your purpose guided you through this year, what impact it had on you as a leader, and also what impact it had on the company? Yeah, I actually think um, those that went into the pandemic with a very strong sense of purpose were able to double down on it in a time of crisis. Because I think clarity of purpose provides 
clarity of direction in a time of crisis. And, and so for Best Buy, our purpose is to enrich lives through technology. And we believe that's not just a tagline. We believe that's fundamentally what we're here to do. And so that's our company purpose. But we have also talked a great deal about our social purpose. What are we here in a balanced way across our constituencies to do in a, in a way that gives back to our communities, gives back to our country? But there's also our personal purpose. And at Best Buy, we've talked about how do I tie my purpose into that of the company? And when you find an intersection between the company, the social, and the personal purpose, there is great power in that. And in a time of crisis, the clearer you are about the intersection of those things, the more quickly you can make decisions and pivot. So an example being, we strongly believe we're here to enrich lives through technology. So that meant as the pandemic hit and we knew our customers needed the things that we had, then how do I find the safest way to do that so I can fulfill my social purpose, keeping people safe, which was our first priority. And that's what drove us to a curbside model. Yeah, that's so interesting. And, and, and frankly, to me, a little bit counterintuitive. I mean, if you had asked me in March, I would have said that what I was going to expect to happen is that everybody was going to be focused on the bottom line because the bottom line was deteriorating fast. I mean, you had your stores were suddenly all closed. They weren't selling anything. You look at the bottom line and you say, holy crap, I've got a problem here. I'm going to put purpose off to the side. I'm going to put all the stakeholder capitalism stuff on a back burner and deal with my short term problem. Why didn't that happen? I think it's about, as it always is, finding balance amongst those constituencies. So when it's something as base as people's lives are at stake, that's going to drive you to strike a different balance between this very near term financial outcome than almost any other competing factor. And so for us, we set three principles right at the beginning of the pandemic. And it was to keep employees and customers safe. It was to protect the employee experience as much as we could for as long as possible. And it was to come out of this, not just a vital company, but a vibrant one. And in all decisions, we were trying to strike the balance between those things. So trust me, make no mistake, we were anchoring hard on the financial decisions we needed to make to keep this company, like I said, vital, but ultimately vibrant. But we also knew, based on what we were hearing from customers, that if we took care of them today, in the moment, that would be very important for our brand over the longer term. And my job is not just to maximize the you know, cash flow, the profitability of a quarter. Our job as leaders is to make this a vital company over the longer term. And that's not just about that one moment of you know inch of more profit. That mm. is about the credit you get with your customers over the longer term because you are prioritizing their safety. Corey, one of the, the uh, things that happened during this tumultuous year when so much happened uh, was the, the the killing of George Floyd, which really uh, shone a spotlight for all of us on problems of diversity and inclusion in the country as a whole, but also got a lot of people thinking about diversity and inclusion in business. What effect did it have on you at, uh, at Best Buy? One of the things that's always been core to our value system is the importance of inclusion and diversity. And frankly, it's because it is an imperative we reflect our communities. We have almost a thousand stores all over this country in a variety of communities. We need to reflect every customer that's coming into our stores. That being said, I think every one of us also know it's been proven time and again, diverse teams produce better outcomes. And we said boldly to our customers, all of them, we will do better. And we meant it both on a company level, but also a community and a country level. And that means underrepresentation in our own business, but it also means overcoming technology inequality. It also means making sure that there are job opportunities for people who yep. need it most. And so we took time with our employee base and really listened, lots of open forums, many of the things I know many of the people that are listening are doing as well. And we just came out with, and our team helped us create a series of bold commitments. And what we've said is one out of every three non-hourly corporate positions will be filled by a, a BIPOC employee, a Black Indigenous person of color. One out of three non-hourly field roles will be filled by a, a female employee, a woman in the field. And we're targeting those. Those are, I think, our real targeted efforts to address the places where we see gaps in our own company. And then we're going to foster retention that reflects, interestingly, um, and we want our senior leadership team to reflect our board composition. Our board is 50 per, over 50 
50% female right now, um, about a quarter people of color. And we, we believe all of our leadership teams should reflect that. But also outside of these walls, we're going to reach 30,000 teens through a network of 100 teen tech centers. We're going to provide $44 million to um, expand uh, a student um, college prep opportunities and um, adding 16 scholarships to HBCU colleges so that we have that pipeline of opportunity. And then here in the Twin Cities, back to our own community, we are going to provide opportunities for teens here to go through these teen tech centers, go through scholarships that we provide, and come back into this company in guaranteed internships and jobs. And so I think if there's any, I, I could go on and on because there's organic efforts. And I think that the point here is we feel strongly that we need to continuously think about ways in which we can set the goals for real change, not just here, but across our country. And I think the message that I have is one of resilience in this work. It is not just about this year or this moment in time. It is about how each of us continuously is iterating and thinking about how we drive change for the long term. Yeah, very interesting. So, Corey, I'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal ball for us. Let's let's just forget 2021. Take me to 2022. How does your world look different in 2022 than you thought it was going to look when you became CEO a year ago? I think we're much further down the pipe than I would have guessed on adoption of and frankly pull on starting with digital experiences. And that means, you know, for many retailers, we tend to start with humans. We're just so geared to start with humans. And instead, this digital first mentality is embedded in all the decisions we're making now. And by 2022, I believe it's exactly how every consumer will for sure start their journey on what they're trying to get done in their homes. I also think, and you hit on it, this idea of the penetration of consumer electronics writ large in people's homes and in the way they live is wonderful for all of us. Because what's great about CE, it's innovative, it's disruptive in a very good way, and it's competitive. And that means that in the next you know, small span of time, more will be done to innovate, more will be done to disrupt in a good way, more will be done to compete. And that will only provide the consumer with more options in their homes. And I think for all of us, that accelerated adoption in a way that's really powerful and will continue to allow us the room to innovate and really help consumers understand what cool things they can be doing in their homes. Yeah, and how about you as CEO? How will you act differently in 2022 than you might have had you not lived through the last year? It's interesting. I think I have a personal hypothesis that my job as a leader is to create the conditions for other amazing leaders to be successful. And doubling down on that point of view in the last nine months or so, I think, has been a huge component of our collective success. Meaning when you unleash other amazing people to do great work, um, they will organically do more than you ever thought possible. And I, I think it's been so rewarding to watch, but it also provides a bit more confidence that, no, that feels like the right way to go. And so I think for me as a leader, doubling down on um, what I feel is important, that authentic approach to leadership, which has really resonated, I think, in a time where our teams for sure want to understand really how we as leaders are thinking, feeling, and acting. Um, I think that will inform perhaps what looks like a slightly different leadership team of the future versus where we would have been in a 2019. Yeah, I, I've also heard a number of people, I mean, it builds on what you're saying, a number of people say that the crisis has forced them to be empathetic in a way that they were not fully accustomed to, uh, uh, the kind of conversations they have found themselves having with their own staffs are very different, and they're much more involved in the health and well-being of their employees than they were uh, uh, before. I, I, do, do you notice a difference there, or was that something that you were you all have always been on top. Well, it's interesting. Heading into the pandemic, well before it started, um, we had four leadership behaviors, and we call them our inclusive leadership behaviors, as we strive to create an inclusive environment where everyone genuinely feels like they belong. Yeah. And the behaviors are vulnerability, empathy, courage, mm. and grace. Mm. And if there's ever been a period of time where we have doubled down on what we already felt kind of in the soul of our best by being, it's yeah. been the last nine months. And so for me, it feels less like a change in how I or the rest of the leadership team are leading. It's more of um, an emphasis that what we thought to be true 
it turns out really, really is true. Hey, uh, Corey, every CEO I have ever interviewed has told me that there were things they learned in their first year on the job uh, that were incredibly important and that they weren't prepared for, that the, the job is different than every job you hold up to that point. And there are some big, uh, important breakthroughs that happen. What, what would you say is the one thing you have learned in the last year that you that surprises you that maybe you weren't fully prepared for? No matter how much you think you know about how you will lead in this role, you genuinely have no idea until you see the challenges in front of you. There is no way I could have walked into this job thinking, here is exactly how I will lead through a pandemic. And the pure nature of there being millions of books on leadership means no one, no one's done it right. No one's done it perfectly. No one's got the answer. And so for me, it was really embracing this idea that there is no playbook and you need to double down as a leader on what you hold dear, on what's important to you. And that actually authentically is what will help you be successful. One last question for you. We, we all uh, we all trek to Las Vegas every January partly to see the just acres and acres and acres of new products that have been put out, partly to see each other and to have the opportunity to be together and talk about trends and to be inspired. Uh, and we can't do it this year. How, how are you, what are you doing to replace that? Uh, what, 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 are the, what are the tools you can use to stay on top of the zeitgeist and what's going on in the industry? Yeah, one of uh, the other big learnings I had over the last year, Ellen, is this idea of looking outside. You can get very insular as a company and it, certainly as a leader because there's so many polls on your time, but prioritizing the time to look outside. And so for me, that can come in a variety of ways. I am uh, a voracious online researcher and reader. And yeah. so I follow every single publication that is geared toward what's the newest thing, what's the coolest thing, what's the thing you should take a look at. And so I use all those tools. But I also, as best I can, I try to just get out there and look and see what else is out there. Um, you know, I always find our stores to be hubs of inspiration. I never know exactly every single SKU that's sitting in one of our stores. So taking the time to walk through, talk to our associates about what they love and what their customers are asking for, but really prioritizing time outside of kind of the insular walls of what we already believe to be true, and instead pushing myself to experience as much as I can um, the way other people are working, the things other people are using, and then the newest and latest and greatest. That's why I'm so excited we're still having this event. Yeah. The yeah. event doesn't have to look the same, it can still inspire. Corey Berry, thank you so much. Fascinating conversation. Hope to see you in person, maybe in Las Vegas a year from now. Oh, thank you so much, Alan. It was an absolute treat. I really appreciate it. I can't think of a better way to start our day than an interview like that one. Hello and welcome back to CS 2021. I'm Naomi Kyle. And I'm Brian Tong and together we are the Wanda Twins. Or yeah. Your CES ambassadors, I guess, your, your guides here. So we're going to see you through the rest of the day here at CES. And as Naomi mentioned, we get to start off our day with a bang. Naomi, what struck you the most about what we just heard from that fireside chat with Best Buy CEO Corey Berry? I think it was really interesting, first of all, that she was she started as a CEO right when everything started happening. So imagine having to start your first time as a CEO, do it like having to change everything that Best Buy has known and, and has done for so many years to really pivot uh, to a different way of, of conducting their business. I thought it was really fascinating too, her approach to like being authentic mm -hmm. and really uh, just a fascinating conversation overall with her. Um, just huge, huge shout out to her for, for, for doing such a great job in 2020 of all years. <laughs> I think we heard things kind of the way she approached things that I actually haven't really heard the way C CEOs talk like that. Right. That's what that's what I was impressed by. Yeah, she, she's my, my new go-to person. Your, your new go-to. Yeah, if I'm ever a CEO, I'm gonna look to her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, Corey talks about a unifying factor. Uh, what do you think gave Best Buy the edge uh, when it came to, you know, areas of brick and mortar, um, retail overall, like folding during the pandemic. like. Well, look, I think Best Buy had obviously the luxury of being based as a consumer electronics company yeah. that sells tech. 
And we know that tech is how many of us are surviving, coping, dealing with the pandemic, yeah. right? We've seen webcam sales explode, people working from home, cl people taking class from home, everything really being remote and everything being handled digitally. So quite honestly, they were one of the unique businesses compared to others that were set for this kind of digital transition that really that accelerated all of a sudden. Not as many businesses were as lucky, but Best Buy def definitely benefited from being that type of company. Yeah, and having their online purchasing approach uh, just ready to go mm -hmm, for something mm -hmm. like this. Um, Corey actually answers this question eloquently, very eloquently, I must say. So let's take a listen to her answer. I have to say, you picked one hell of a time to become a CEO. Every new CEO would say the first year was unexpected. I will tell you, the first year was incredibly <laughs> unexpected. You have a story to top all of theirs, I'm sure. What did you see after the pandemic hit? Our hypothesis around enriching lives through technology became instantly the reality for every single person, meaning all of a sudden we were all stuck at home on the backs of technology. For anyone with kids, your kids literally overnight were learning from home. For anyone with large corporate offices, all of your employees were likely working from home. I mean, nobody knew there'd be a run on webcams. Um, that was quite at the pace <laughs> that we saw. And yet suddenly it became the the hottest item that we had. And so it, it definitely was a challenge to make sure we had all that your people wanted. When you're so worried about your employees' safety, your customers' safety, and making sure people get what you know they fundamentally need to live. That's a very unifying factor. Yeah, yeah. That's the script just now. All right, well, you know, talking about, again, being thrown into the fire yeah. at that moment. From day one. And really being able to have to adapt on the fly. That, that is the best way to kind of earn your stripes with, uh, you know, a new employee force that has never met you before. That's and right. to be like, okay, do we believe in this person or not? Well, I, I'm sure she pretty much showed, showed what they're possible. What's oh, she showed of. her skills. I can't even talk right now. They were, they were cap what she was capable of. Yeah. Say words, Brian. All right. Hey, if you guys like this fireside chat, remember, we've got a lot more where that came from in our exhibitor showcase, including live demos and presentations from products that you might find in a Best Buy like Asus with the new lineup of gaming laptops and peripherals. I know you're going to be digging those a lot, Naomi. Yes. Gaming right here. So check that out throughout Heck the event yeah. in the exhibitor showcase. All right, we're going to uh, continue our look at the world of digital. That is right, uh, health and the tech innovations around it especially. And to do that, Rich and Justine caught up with Roy ja uh, Jacobs, EVP and Chief Business Leader of Connect Care at Philips, to tell us a bit more about their roadmap for digital solutions, starting with a goal to help billions. Take a look.